Welcome to the American Society of Agronomy's webinar series on cover crops. My name is Luther Smith, the Director of Certification and Online Education for ASA, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. We'd like to start off by thanking our sponsors who have made this possible that we can deliver this information to you at no cost to you as a participant. SARE, Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education, Iowa SARE, Minnesota SARE, National Association of Conservation Districts, DuPont Pioneer, Cover Crop Solutions, National Wildlife Federation, Grassland Oregon, La Crosse Seed, the Cisco Companies, American Farmland Trust, Department of Soil Science, University of Wisconsin, Klinkenborg Aerial Spraying and Seeding, and Practical Farmers of Iowa. I'd also like to give a special thank you to Sarah Carlson, Practical Farmers of Iowa, and Ryan Stockwell, National Wildlife Federation. Sarah and Ryan were very instrumental in helping us put this together, the four sections that we've had, and we're coming to our last one today. And as we wrap things up to date with today's webinar, I'd like to also introduce you to, if you haven't already, to our other online courses and webinars that will be coming up in the near future. You can find out more about these by going to www.agronomy.org. For additional information and as a resource, you can check out SARE. SARE programs provide farmers, researchers, professionals, and graduate student opportunities to conduct research that advances sustainable agricultural practices. To learn more about cover crops following this webinar, check out the Cover Crops Topic Room on the SARE webpage, which is on your screen right now. One topic we will not be touching today and we have not in this series is crop insurance. Uh, there was a very well done webinar in late January and you can connect to that and get that information through the link that's on your screen. That will cover, crop, cover crops and crop insurance if you'd like to learn more about that. Asking questions today, you can do that by using the question box in the dashboard that appeared when you connected to the webinar. All you have to do is write your question in there and we'll field those as we go throughout the webinar today towards the end of the broadcast. If we don't get to yours, we'll, we'll get to that within the coming week or two as we have someone field those questions. So moving to today's topic, cover crop management and termination. Our first speaker will be Mike Plummer. Mike has his master's from the University of Southern Illinois in plant and soil science. He was an extension educator for over 34 years at the University of Illinois in agriculture and natural resources. Mike now does conservation agriculture consulting both nationally and internationally. He is the coordinator of the Illinois Council on Best Management Practices and conducts programming and research in cover crops, conservation, and watershed water quality. He's worked the past 37 years in conservation tillage and no-till systems and 32 years with cover crops. He'll be followed by Steve Berger. Steve farms near Wellman in southeast Iowa with his family on a diversified corn, soybean, and fire to finish swine operation. The Bergers have been practicing continuous no-till for 35 years and have been using rye cover crops for 14 years. So I'll turn it over to you, Mike, to get things started. There we go. That's showing the screen? Yep, we're seeing your screen. You just switch to full screen mode and we'll be ready to go. I uh, just clicked on it. There you go. Now it's switched. All right. Uh, we'll start talking about uh, cover crop management and termination. And I think probably the biggest thing that if we're going to be talking about the management and, and termination both, it requires a lot of forward planning especially since we're looking at the situation where we're going to be using herbicides to terminate. And some of those herbicides do have some carryover issues, so we need to be thinking about that. We'll talk a little bit as we go through the program. <coughs> cover crops do take a lot more management, uh, and we do select cover crops based on soil needs and, and seeding rates based on how we're going to use them, on what management system we're going to use. So as we're looking at mixes, and we're getting a lot more work with mixes, the more cover crops you put in the mix, the higher level of management, and you may have to change how you how you control them. <laughs> so 
so the planning starts today. Uh, we need to be looking at what row crops we're going to raise, what our crop rotation is going to be, and probably start thinking about buying seed for next year. Uh, you just talked about the RMA issues, so I'll just pop this screen up. The, there are zones that they've put forward uh, when we're talking about termination. Uh, that will determine when, when you terminate it, because typically in zone four, there's a lot of, a lot of folks terminate at planting time or uh, but before crop emergence. Uh, seed source is really critical, I think, and we're looking with a lot of cover crops. There's a lot of different varieties of each cover crop, and there's a lot of major development being done with cover crops. Uh, frequently, right now, because of the seed supply, we're running into the situation where there's a lot of VNS cover crops out there, which means variety not stated. So the one thing I want to stress is you really don't have any idea what's in the bag other than uh, you got to rely on your dealer to tell you what's what he thinks is in the bag and who the grower was that, that produced it. Uh, one issue we've run into in the past is if it's VNS, there may be different varieties in the bag which may have different maturities or even different growth characteristics. So that can cause you some major issues when we're trying to control them. I always recommend you talk to other farmers in the area, other people in the area, and what varieties work the best. And one of the things we're running into in the last two years is we have a lot of folks seeding cover crops at extremely high seeding rates and getting very dense stands. And, and, and because we're getting such dense stands, it also makes us a little more difficult to control some of it. Uh, again, getting reliable uh, seed, quality seed. Uh, talk to your seed dealer in the area. Talk to other farmers in the area about that. One of the issues that I also wanted to bring up that we're starting to, to run into as we get more and more acres of cover crops is small seeds have some dormancy issues that we got to learn to manage, and this plays into your herbicide control very, very specifically. Uh, Typically, most small seeds have a primary dormancy where not every seed is going to germinate the year you plant it. And we've seen that in a lot of different seeds. It's pretty commonly known in hairy vetch. We've got a lot of hard seed that doesn't, doesn't germinate. But then we're also getting into the situation where we're getting a lot of seed production in the same year we're using it. And with latent dormancy like that, we do see a little difference in germination as well. And some of that means that that seed will germinate the next year. So we got to be aware that the, even though we get excellent control next spring, next fall, we may see some seed come up. That's not because of resistance issues. That's because it's probably a latent dormant. Uh, in 2011 and 2012, we had some, some very rough fall conditions and dry weather conditions. For the other type of dormancy, uh, the crescent dormancy is accentuated by really adverse conditions or late planting or extreme heat and cold and dry. And I've investigated a number of fields in the, in the last two years especially where we've got a, a seeding that's taken place in the fall for, for a cover crop, get a, a reasonable stand but not as thick as you expected, grows fine in the spring, we control it the next spring and the following fall and the, once we're doing harvest on the field, we're finding we've got a stand of a cover crop back in the field. So it's not due to resistance necessarily. It's due to the fact that we can actually go ahead and spray it in the fall if we wanted to and control it. But the idea being that it is going to be there, we need to be, pay attention to it and uh, manage it like a new cover crop. Uh, one of the farmers in the fields that I looked at, we checked on, he thought it was a great idea. He seeded his cover crops one time, and he got two years out of the one seeding. But uh, a lot of other folks get, get afraid that when they see that, second year and they get a lot of seed come up in the fall. They think that their crop went to seed, not necessarily, it may be due to the environmental conditions when they planted it. The other thing you need to do with cover crops is you need to be able to spray them when you, when you want to spray them. If you're going to target your cover crop for specific nitrogen requirements, then you need to let them, those legumes grow longer. Or if you're uptaking nitrogen and recovering it, you've got to, you've got to be able to kill it when you want to release it. Uh, if you're going to get nitrogen out of the grasses, and we've got to kill it vegetative stage to get the most nitrogen out. You can need to look at root growth, how much you want, and if you're going to let cover crops grow for a longer period to get more of a mulch or alleopathic effect, you know, that'll determine when you need to spray it. Also, you need to consider multiple herbicide uh, applications. A lot of times we don't need those, 
but I think everyone needs to be aware of the fact that after you, you apply a herbicide to a cover crop in the spring, we're normally early, we're normally cool, we're normally under plant stress, so not all herbicides work as, as well as they should in the spring. So be prepared to scout those fields in a couple of weeks and, and look and see what, what your situation is and then do a respray on, on, on those fields. Uh, the other thing that we're pushing really hard is to consider non-glyphosate options. We're concerned about developing glyphosate resistance and uh, in different weeds as well as in cover crops. So consider non-glyphosate options whenever you're working with cover crops. And if you're going to spray when you need to spray, I thought I'd show this from one of the producers I work with. Uh, this is a, a home-built rig that has a Raven monitor and spray system on it. Uh, complete GPS also has secondary with the foam markers. Um, everything you would you need to spray, and and the thing is, he's set up that he can spray his cover crops anytime he feels like. And uh, in 2013, with the wet spring, he had all of his cover crops sprayed at the right growth stage. Uh, they were he was ready to go uh, when time to start raising crops. So and getting his crops planted. So you need to, if you're going to have a lot of acres of cover crops, you definitely need to be thinking about some way to get across fields, especially if you've got a wetter soil type. Let's talk a little bit about some of the cover crops and how we're working with them. Uh, many varieties uh, of cereal rye have been developed for, for wheat, or are being developed for weed control. Uh, we do, we get really good weed suppression with annual rye, I mean cereal rye. Uh, Typically, when we work with farmers, we'll start them at a lower seeding rate than what we normally would use for a wheat control. 35 to 50 pounds is one that we find works very well for most folks. It's not so heavy that it causes them problem, but at the same time, that it's enough to give us good control uh, for, for some of the winter annual weeds and, and help with erosion and things like that. If we're looking at controlling glyphosate-resistant mare's tail or some of the other more resistant weeds, we normally go 60 to 80 pounds of uh, cereal rye to do that. And then for termination, we look at uh, glyphosate or uh, bromoxone corn herbicides or soybean herbicides. Uh, just to give you a quick show of one of the studies that I'm doing, this is in, we've got two years of data on, and multiple replications. This is uh, glyphosate resistant mare's tail that, that we definitely have an, an issue with. Uh, this has already been sprayed twice with glyphosate, uh, two weeks apart whereas the uh, bottom left-hand corner is cereal rye that actually we cut off to, to, and removed to, to see how much of an allelopathic effect there was versus how much of a mulch effect there, there could be. And we're getting a really good control of glyphosate-resistant mare's tail with cereal rye. Uh, several other uh, replications, this is the second year of the study, and it's a little hard to see, but this is... 30 days after the cereal rye residue was removed, and if you look real close, you'll see a couple mares tails starting to come through on the left-hand side where the cereal rye was. That's showing us that we don't have complete control with the allelopathy. It does run out, and uh, we are starting to pick up some weeds uh, from the cereal rye. So what about wheat? Um, can wheat work uh, as a cover crop? How do we control it? Uh, one of the biggest issues that we see with wheat is, is if you have wheat growing in the area, a lot of people will have a commercial wheat field, and if we plant wheat as a cover crop earlier, then we've got a problem developing insects uh, and diseases that can't spread in nearby fields. Uh, typically on wheat, we've not had a real problem controlling wheat, normally a glyphosate or a gramoxone with normal corn residuals or soybean residuals has, has worked quite well for us on controlling wheat. Got a lot of people asking about crimson clover because they're looking at a, a winter annual legume that that can give us uh, some nitrogen production. The thing about uh, crimson is it's a fall seeded legume. Typically, will bloom from late April in through May, and as as a general rule, it dies by itself by the first week of June. So normally, control is not not a, a real problem with it. Uh, herbicide wise, we typically use glyphosate and 2,4-D. We have a few producers using uh, gramoxone and corn herbicides, uh, and it's fairly easy to kill. We've really not had much trouble with it. Variety selection, Dixie's probably the most common, and if you see a VNS bag, it's more than likely Dixie. 
Uh, Auburn University has a couple other varieties that, that are really good varieties, but seed's hard to come by. What about vetches? Uh, hairy vetch, woolly pod vetch are, are real commonly used, and probably hairy more than woolly pod because it's more readily available. And we've got a number of different varieties on vetch available out there, and flowering date may run anywhere from well, the third week of April into the middle of May. Vetches are all very highly 2,4-D sensitive, and that's what we normally use to control vetch. A very low rate of, of 2,4-D at the pint to quart rates uh, gives you an excellent control on vetch all the time. And one of the things that we, we frequently laugh about is if you sprayed one part of the field with 2,4-D, the vapor drift off it would kill a lot of the, a lot of the field downwind from that. Uh, that's tolerates glyphosate very well. Uh, a standard 0.75 pound of, of acid equivalent typically will just slow vet's growth down for four or five days and it'll take off growing again. And I've seen some producers actually have used glyphosate in their vet's fields to take some of the weeds out of the field uh, and, not, and let the vet's grow for another month. It's not something we'd recommend, but uh, we've seen it done. Uh, Gramoxone with corn herbicides as well is very effective on vetch. So we really don't see much trouble uh, killing vetch. If you want to roll it down instead of use herbicides, that has to be done when the vetch is in full flower. Just to show you what some of the planting conditions we're looking at in vetch, this is pre-flower, which makes it easier to plant. And uh, some people will actually use a herbicide before planting to, to wilt the vets down just a little bit. Uh, other folks are very comfortable planting in, in real heavy vets. It's not, a, not an issue. Vets does produce a, a pretty good mulch effect that helps control a lot of our weeds later on. So that uh, also provides a fair, fair amount of nitrogen that, that we can get to the field. Uh, Rapeseed's being used quite a bit lately. The current research by the University of Illinois and Southern Illinois University are looking at uh, cyst nematode management and the SDS control. So what we're looking at on rapeseed is typically if we're going to seed it straight, we, we normally use 5 to 10 pounds per acre. It's a very tiny seed and uh, seed cost is pretty low, so we, we can use a, a higher seeding rate on it. It's fairly easily controlled uh, with 2,4-D, dicamba, glyphosate, uh, even chlorimuron, pursuit scepter, and other corn herbicides will normally control it in a normal ro rotation. So really not having much trouble having any uh, management on as far as control issues on rapeseed. Probably our biggest issue is getting it planted timely and uh, finding some that, that are winter hardy to last until spring to give us the most effect on uh, that we're looking for on disease control. Oats is frequently a cover crop that, that we recommend to producers, mainly because it establishes fairly fast. It's got good erosion control. And uh, the, uh, the other thing is that it normally kills at 20 degrees. So if it's going to kill at 20 degrees, we're not really that concerned uh, about the herbicides on it because it, it's going to be killed over winter. Typically, uh, we, we see 30 to 50 pounds alone, but uh, most of the time we're putting radishes and other things in it, so we drop the rates down to 10 to 20. And again, at winter kills, we really don't have that much trouble with it. Looking at oil seed radish and oats mixes, it's, it's worked very well. This is just showing you some from Indiana where the, you can see the September 14th seeded and what they look like uh, on the, the 12th of November. But radish is also uh, can winter kill pretty easily. Normally when we get down below 20 degrees, 15 will normally kill them dead uh, in one night, but uh, as we get below 20, several nights we'll normally take them out as well. Uh, the oats will start dying as well. So as we get into the winter time, I just looked at the BLM, as we get, yeah. kinds of observations. So the, here we're looking at... Uh, at this point, we don't have a... a we got okay. So we got uh, pretty pretty easy winter kill. That's a good place for a lot of people to start is uh, oats and brassicas. Uh, if we're looking at brassica control specifically, 
Uh, these are the herbicides that typically give us really good control. Pursuit Scepter, uh, your classic. Uh, glyphosate with 2,4-D works pretty well, but uh, I, again, most of the brassicas will winter kill, uh, especially old seed radish. One, the one that most people ask me about is annual ryegrass and some of the issues with it, uh, and having or having problems with with control in it. Uh, typically, we find that a lot of folks seed ryegrass at way too heavy of a seeding rate, which will make for some real uh, thick issues and getting enough herbicide down to get control on it. So um, typically we'd recommend on ryegrass vegetative control before the first joint. That also means it's going to be pretty cool. Uh, one thing that you never want to do when you're trying to kill ryegrass is mix atrazine or calisto to it. It will cause you a lot of problems and we found also it, at the vegetative stage early, sharpen will also cause quite a bit of damage when it's mixed with it. But we've got basis blend, resolve, 2,4-D, Princep, and uh, Cidua that all work quite well when they're, when they're mixed with glyphosate. So one thing I want to point out, that glyphosate only works on actively growing plants. That's an issue because we're normally spraying in cold weather. Uh, if we got frost or freezing weather, typically we've got to wait a minimum of two days after that weather to allow the plants to recover before they will translocate the glyphosate. So again, make sure they use full uh, AMS in the treatment, 10 gallons of water, and uh, most of the research that we've seen done and from our work as well, we see a, a pH of the spray water of around 5 to 2 uh, seems to give us the most activity. We've been doing some, some detailed research work with uh, Brian Young and uh, Dr. Holting on herbicide trials. Those are uh, available from them. Uh, this is just a couple notes real quick, and we're looking at if you can see this, we've got a, a root max, temp tebow maximum bounty as far as in the columns. Uh, we're, so we're looking at diploid annual ryegrass as well as tetraploids. And the idea that tetraploids are supposed to be harder to kill, and what we found is actually there's really not much difference in, in the different ones. And this is just showing some of the, the Roundup mix, uh, the Power Max, and through a couple more here at the bottom. This is the old herbicide treatments we started using back in the 80s to control forage grasses. And if we're looking at um, two-shot treatments like a Gramoxone, followed up in two weeks with like a Select Max, or even Gramoxone followed two weeks later with another treatment of Gramoxone, and we got excellent control on it. That way we're not using any glyphosate at all. Um, throw this in because a lot of people get confused, so I, I thought I'd say, how can you fail to get ryegrass control? And really spraying in the after, afternoons in cold, cloudy weather, using coarse droplets, not using AMS, using too much water, uh, and frequently people mix the glyphosate in the water before they put the AMS in, which causes a lot of problem. Um, or mix an atrazine or callisto with, with the, the glyphosate. So how do you fix it? Sometimes uh, if it's damaged bad enough, we can't fix it. We we'll normally recommend go back in with Ramoxone and completely burn the field off and then follow it back up at a later time with, uh, with another spray when the weather's a little bit warmer to, to get control on it. Uh, control on wheat, if we got wheat or ryegrass in wheat, uh, this is some of the herbicides they use, glyphosate, Ramoxone, or clethodim. Uh, adding residual axiom zidua, and then following up in an early spring treatment with uh, Powerflax, Axial, or Osprey in order to clean it out of wheat fields because it can be a major weed in wheat. So herbicide carryovers, one of the things we worry about is it will give us some poor fall establishment, poor fall growth. Uh, it can also weaken the plant so it does winter kill. So we need to know what those restrictions are, look at your labels and see see which ones that you're seeing some problems with. Typically, brassicas are really sensitive to the products like Classic Pursuit and Scepter, uh, but li there's little guidance on the label, so uh, ask your chemical dealer on what they're looking at. This last year, we had prevented plant acres, and we found that uh, some of those products that were used for to, for clean cleaning the field uh, to, to avoid weed problems actually 30 days later, killed the grasses and legumes for the cover crops. So 
just give you a quick summary. Here's what an overlook uh, of some of the different products that we're, we're using uh, for controlling. Uh, Cerari, uh we talked about that. Glyph and, uh, glyphosate is pretty commonly used, but I think we need to be starting to look at on all of these different uh, cover crops. Let's look at other types of herbicides rather than, rather than glyphosate. Just put it a, a website in there if you're concerned about ryegrass. There's several really good publications at the uh, annualryegrasscovercrop.com website. Uh, if you're looking for information on cover crops and selection, the cover crop selector uh, is pretty good and I'll always reference everybody back to going to the Midwest Cover Crop Council website. Other questions? Thanks, Mike. We'll switch over to Steve. I'll set you up, Steve. And then we'll come back to questions for both of our panelists at the end of, the, of their presentation. So keep writing them in the question box, and then we'll field them towards the end of the, the broadcast. OK, Steve, take it away. OK, thank you very much, Luther. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our farming operation in southeast Iowa. And uh, we've been um, no-tilling about 35 years in some of our early no-till and then followed up with cover crop here continuously the last uh, 10 to 12 years. Uh, we're located in uh, southeast Iowa in Washington County. And uh, for those traveling through the state, we'd be about 15 miles uh, south of Interstate 80. And uh, we're in the southern drift plains, uh, rolling hills. Um, we do get into some river bottom and, and terrace ground. And uh, so we have uh, just several different types of soil. And uh, here we're looking 5,000 feet above, looking at the cover crop in various stages of um, senescence and growth. This is uh, taken about uh, mid-April a year ago. We're seeing some fields that have already been sprayed are starting to turn uh, brown. They look yellow from the air, but these are fields that probably go to corn. Uh, a field like this here is, is dark green yet. It's probably going to go to soybeans. And so 100% of our acres are uh, been planted to cereal rye. And you can see that here. We're kind of thinking watersheds. We're trying to protect that topsoil, trying to keep the nutrients there. And uh, this watershed here is English River and is actually made a watershed this year. So we're getting actively involved in that. But uh, anyway, that's what it looks like from the air. If I had to show one picture for the whole program, I would take this taken from Bing Maps. It's the bird's eye view. And it's showing one of our fields here. This is a cereal rye growing. Long-term continuous no-till with cereal rye cover crop. And then the, the adjacent fields, this to the south here, sometimes no-tilled. You see quite a bit of erosion here going on. Same with here. I and mean, if you go down here to aggressively tilt field, you see ditches you can't even cross. So you really have about three different um, types of fields going on here. You've got the long-term cover crop no-till, you've got some no-till, and then you've got the aggressively tilled. And I guess the point here is it just the cereal rye just stops erosion, and that's uh, what we're finding on our hills, especially with soybeans on sea slopes. Long-term no-till, we have a hard time keeping cover, and that's why we did go to cover crops. And this would be kind of the end game. This is what we want to see. We want to see a good cover crop that's been died or been killed, and then we got a good field of corn grown in here. This is about the middle of May, several years ago. If I had a two or three inch rain on this, I think I could hold this field together, and not have much erosion at all, and I also got a good corn crop on the way. This is taken last year. This is a rye cover crop field. The rye has been sprayed. This rye was about six to eight inches tall when we sprayed it, and you can just see the carcasses laying there now. There's not much left there, but that was a rye cover crop field. This field was planted ahead of that cold, rainy weather we had back in April last year, and that field turned out pretty well. And so uh, we feel that um, you know, we're, our goal is to try to get good stands. We're looking at ear counts, trying to maintain good, even stands is the goal here, and uh, try to keep cover on those fields. Just another shot of a continuous corn field. Another rye cover crop field. See, we have rye, rye that's been killed here. You probably wouldn't know it unless I told you that, but we're also trying to see good corn stands and, and get good even emergence. So that was 
Now we're looking at a two and a half acre grid uh, soil sample showing organic matter of one of our fields. And one of the interesting things, we soil sampled the fence row. We're seeing like six and a half percent, six percent in these fence rows. This here, 4.7, that's an old barn yard. That barn hasn't been there for 50 years. Some of these lighter areas are sandy areas. But what we're seeing here is the last 150 years, we've oxidized off quite a bit of organic matter. Some of this has eroded away, and we're about you know 50% of what uh, where, where we started 150 years ago in Iowa. And if we were to pull that fence, rent the field over here, and farm across it, we see our yield monitors jumping, you know, 40 and 50 bushel all day long as we go back and forth through that fence row. You know, so there's something going on there. A lot more microbial life, higher organic matter. And when we saw this, you know, that's one of the reasons we kind of jump more to using cover crops. And um, this is pretty common. Our organic matters, here we're looking at through time, starting here in 2004, 8, and 12. Every four years we've been. Uh, sampling on a grid sample for our manure plants, and um, it looks like we're picking up about a tenth of a percent organic matter a year here, just a little under a tenth of a percent a year. And these are, again, no-till fields with cover crop and uh, quite a bit of manure, too. So we've got several things going on there, but we see our organic mat matter just nudging up a bit. Here again, another field, like 2.6, the 2.8, the 3.2. So we're starting to see a gradual increase. And it'll probably reach a plateau here sometime, and I'm um, not sure how high it'll go, but right now it's, it's going up, and we think that's a, a good sign of uh, soil health. It's often been said uh, healthy soils are to be covered at all times, and uh, looking at a calendar, you know, January through December, we're trying to keep a cover crop. In our case, it's a cereal rye, and we're at about this point right here, and we're going to start to terminate this cover crop here in the next, oh, I say, three weeks. Then we'll plant our corn and soybeans, and then we'll come back and we're going to we'll do some aerial seeding here, possibly, and then we'll start to harvest. Our harvest will start mid-September and go on through the first of November, and then we're going to start seeding. In our case, we'll be drilling cereal rye. So we're trying to keep uh, something growing in that soil and keep it covered at all times to protect it. Just kind of real quickly what we do in our operation. We'll start seeding cover crop right here. We've got the drill in the field right behind the combine. That drill's in the field the very same day that combine's going. We've got the corn dryer going, the grain cart's hooked up, and that drill's hooked up too. And we're trying to take advantage of the, the growing degree units in the fall, in, in this case where we're drilling. And then we'll come back and do a little bit of plow down. I've been starting to spread more ammonium sulfate to get a little bit of nitrogen out there to start uh, reducing the carbon nitrogen ratios and we'll throw in a little bit of potash with that. Uh, we also have quite a bit of manure, a lot of pretty large swine operation, and we do have access to some turkey manure that we're also spreading in the fall. And then we'll go through the winter time, and then we come back in the spring, about now, uh, through the next three weeks, and we're going to start to spray, terminate this cereal rye. And then hopefully here in about three weeks, four weeks, we're going to start planting corn. We drill all our soybeans with a drill on 10-inch spacings. This is the same drill that we used to, to drill our rye. All our beans are raised for seed. And then we'll come back and I'll, I'll use an ATV sprayer to do my pre-sprays. And then we do side dress uh, most of our corn acres. So this kind of does a real quick summary of, of what we do. And uh, this is my first experience of um, no-tilling. This is back in 1979. This is our first no-till planter. Actually, this was going into cereal rye, and um, this was before Roundup, and we did have to term terminate that with Grimoxoner. In those days, I think they called it just Paraquat. And that was the only time I've ever used Paraquat, but that was my first experience in O-Till, and, uh, and 35 years later, it's just here, me and my dad uh, were out here drilling a seed field, seed soybean field in, uh, in cereal rye, and so we've been at it quite a while, and uh, the no-till has worked well, but we've had to add some cover, and that's where we brought in the cereal rye. A local soil scientist, we had Jason Steele out of the Fairfield office, and uh, Kathleen Wood, the uh, state geologist, uh, who were looking at some microscopic slides of our soil. Here we're on the left, we're comparing a slide that's been long-term um, no-till cover crop, and the one on the right, this is an aggressively tilled field here in, in Washington County. And uh, this is about one centimeter across and about two inches below the soil surface. And we're just looking, see the difference, and I suppose you the one obvious thing is they're just 
uh, more pore spaces and larger pore spaces. More microbial life going on in there. And here in the tilled ground, you just don't see any, any air spaces at all. And uh, this is what we've developed over time. And uh, down here in the lower right, you can just see what, what, what they show in textbooks. And uh, we actually see that in real life. So um, anyway, we're kind of happy to see what's going on with uh, some of our soil samples here. Just looking at it from a, just a spadeful, comparing same soil type just across the fence. This is my um, uh, rye cover crop field. Uh, this was taken April 20th, about five years ago, six years ago and just comparing the soil across the fence in an aggressively tilled field. And it's just pretty obvious there's just not much soil structure there at all in the one on the right hand side. Um, it's a lot wetter. There's just not much microbial life, no roots or anything like here. This soil is almost dry enough it could be planted. And we're still, in 2008, we were still 10 days away from planting, but this, you can just see the difference uh, in soil structures. And this is probably brought on mostly by the cover crop that we've added. Just to kind of demonstrate what infiltration will do to you, here we're in our soils, we're applying 5,500 gallons of swine manure in the fall, and I'm drilling cereal right, right behind it. Now this is one stage for a photo. We were actually, we had about 150 acres, and uh, I was drilling right behind swine manure, surface applied here, and that uh, manure was getting away fast enough, and it wasn't slopping up the, uh, the drill too much. And, uh, I was trying to do it because of the ammonia volatilization issues. I thought if I followed up closer, we may not uh, gas off as much nitrogen. And, uh, but what I think this point is shown here is just the infiltration rates that, that we've developed over time. Now I want to go just through a series of pictures and just show you, kind of compare the differences between a no-till field with cover crop and just fields that, um, that have been tilled. And uh, we've had a lot heavier rain events the last few years, and uh, we're just going to just go through and kind of show some of the differences. And you can just kind of think about, um, you know, what you saw in the previous slides of the, of the particle in the airspace and, um, and what we've developed over time. Here's the uh, same rainfall, about a three-inch rainfall. Uh, this one here was a three-inch rainfall back in 2012, and this was taken five hours after it, uh, that rainfall event. This was the same rainfall event with the field just down the road. Now we're in a C and D slope on a right cover crop that's been terminated. You look through there, there are just not very many gullies at all. It's just, um, you've got stable soil aggregates. There's just not much going on there for soil erosion. We really like to see that. And like there again, that was about a three inch rain. Here's a, another rain many years before that. This was in a, uh, an aggressively tilled field. There's no there's no resiliency at all in that soil. It just goes down to the hard pan here. This is a six inch rain. This was back in about a year ago on April 15th or 16th. We took a six inch rain. And that rise not very tall, but there again, if you look back you know, in the gullies or in the, where the water would run, there's just not much erosion there at all. Follow my pointer here. This field had been sprayed right ahead of that rain, so this rye is on its way out, and this field will get planted yet in April last year. And so we went from this this green rye and the six-inch rain to having this uh, field planted uh, in April. So we did pretty well and felt good about that. Another field here on the prairie. This is a former Farm Progress show site many years ago, getting a lot of erosion off of the prairie soils. Back on some of our C and D slopes. I think what strikes me the most here is the, the cover isn't that impressive, what's left of the rye that's been sprayed. It, you know, there's just not much cover there, but we're still holding this field together pretty good, not much soil erosion. Back to an aggressively tilled field, here's a kernel of corn. This field had been planted. So you can just see the, the field cultivator, the plow pan. There's no soil structure to that at all. You get up in the hills and these the erodibility factors are probably, you know, in that you know, two and three starting to lose organic matter in those places. You just kind of go back and forth. And you kind of see the difference. And these are things like this. It's kind of like an aha moment for me. And we think what um, using cover crops is making the difference. This is back, taken back in 1983 when I was a crop scout. And this is one of the early rye cover crops in Washington County, just comparing a rye cover crop field to a tilled field here. And uh, this is some of, the best, some of the best ground in Washington County. This would be Mahaska, Tainer Soils. 
up here in the, on the plateau, but then you get down in some of these more eroded soils, the erodibility factors like, you know, like a, this would be like a C2 slope here. You know, and so some of these fields could really use some no-till cover crop on it, even though they're non-HEL fields, we feel. Here you can just see the difference between the, the two systems. I'm not sure I can define, define soil quality, but you sure know what it looks like when you see it here. Just the roots, we're getting organic matter from the roots, stabilizing the soil, you know, putting life back into it. Like a rise of, hey, we're just comparing a rye cover crop field to one it hasn't. If you look at the field on the left, you know, in the last 20 years, this field's probably had 60 more trips over it, 60 more passes. So you can think of the, the expense, the time, and the labor. Here we're adding, we're using the sunlight, the photosynthesis, to add organic matter back in the soil, stop soil erosion. So there's quite a few advantages. Here again, we're planting rye in the fall, right in the field. We're drilling cereal rye on 10-inch facings. We want to let it grow out in the fall. We do some aerial seeding rye. It's worked pretty good some years. Uh, we've, we're planting swine manure here, and this inset on the lower right shows the rye that's emerged in this field. I was just curious to know what kind of survival we would get on the rye. It looks like we're going to do pretty good, you know, with even with the manure. In, in the tire tracks. So we're surface applying this manure. A lot of our custom applicators can be a little aggressive uh, with their sweeps, and so we just ask them to apply on the surface, and you know, we're watching our DNR regulations and making sure we're, you know, we're staying legal. This was um, in March 29th, March 29th, two years ago. Just a beautiful rye cover crop field that's going to go to, go to corn. That's what it looked like one hour ago. So you can just see what 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 a year or two will make a difference, and there's just not much growth out there this year. There is cereal rye growing in that field, uh, but this field could have been planted later. It might have been planted at the end of October, and where I'd normally plant on a March for good growth, I didn't get it here. So you you can go back and look. Same field two years ago, the rye cover crop. So every year is just a little bit different. You never know what you're going to get. This is this is some of my biggest rye I've got right now. This was taken about an hour ago. Um, it's still it's still coming out of its winter dormancy. It's it's not actively growing yet. Obviously, it's not ready to be sprayed. But uh, we were starting to spray March 29th, two years ago. Here we're putting on about a quart of glyphosate. I also use an ATV sprayer in case it gets wet. I think that's a pretty important tool to have. We'll rely on our uh, local retailer once in a while to, to use floaters to get over if I can't get it all done myself. So that's another avenue and. Uh, just showing the different growth stages of rye, seedling rye as it comes up. You know, every year you're just going to get a little bit different uh, look at rye, just based on what Mother Nature gives you, how soon you can get the rye planted, and the growth that we get in the spring, or this year the lack thereof. Um, this picture right here on the lower left would be one that um, would be ideal for me to plant into. If I had my choice, that would probably be be the way I could maximize my rye growth and yet still get a good cover crop, although there are a lot of people uh, you know, planting into taller, greener rye too. If we go into soybeans, we're probably going to let that gray, rye grow out a little more. This picture of a field that's been sprayed with glyphosate. I, for my purposes, we use pretty much a four-pound um, glyphosate material. Haven't used too much else. Uh, we usually run 32 to 40 ounces an acre. You'll get it. The more you use, the quicker your kill you'll get. But uh, like Mike said earlier, that rye should be actively growing. And we've been spraying about seven, seven to 14 days before planting corn. Um, that wouldn't have to be. Sometimes you know, we'll start to cut that down maybe to five days ahead of corn. Because as we get used to it, um, we're planting closer to planting time. So it means we may be only about a week ahead of bean planting. And as Mike said earlier, that AMS is pretty important in there to get that in before you put your um, glyphosate in. So this shouldn't be cutting corners. When we do some tank mixes and pre's ahead of beans here, we got some glyphosate in light. We can kill that just fine. Um, we'll burn the leaf a little bit with um, some of the valor in there. It doesn't always take the glyphosate in, in as well, but we've been getting a pretty good kill for the most part. But there is a little more risk. Sometimes you might uh, get some rye regrowth if you spray it late in the day. So there's, um, this is a little closer picture of it. You can kind of see the leaves are getting burned here in this case. But we did get, uh, we did get this rye controlled. This here is a 30 MTZ a few years ago with uh, glyphosate. 
This is going to beans. Uh, this here is just a straight, um, just straight glyphosate in a field of corn that just get a real good kill on this here. You see the, there's no um, burn on the leaf at all because the only thing I had in the tank was glyphosate. Then we're going to come back and plant corn. Uh, just the key thing here, we're putting on um, about 60 pounds of 32% uh, over in a 3 by 2 band on this planter. You can see in the John Deere units here. And I'm also putting on about three gallons of a 624-6. So I'm getting on two forms of nitrogen while I'm planting. I'm also sticking a, an insecticide in for O2 to control the insects. Just another look at the corn planters. Just different looks of rye. In the lower right-hand corner, you see just a little darker green strips. Those are probably manure strips. That rye probably grew out another you know, four or five inches taller, and it's just dying slower. The, the lower left-hand corner, see we're planting in a little bit greener rye. Um, this would be more typical in the upper right-hand corner. So the key thing here, I think, to, to remember is we can control erosion. We've got enough cover out there, and we've also got a pretty darn good seed bed to plant corn in. I feel like I have full potential a yield here. Here's the stem. After we planted uh, corn into rye strips, back on soybeans now. We let that rye grow a little taller. As you see, here's a field that was sprayed with um, glyphosate and zidua. We think the, the zidua, or actually it was um, not zidua, it was fierce. It was, had, had zidua in it, but this was glyphosate and uh, fierce last year. And so you see just the different, uh, basically the rye is a little taller, and uh, we don't have, um, well, we're using a different herbicide every year on it. So bean emergence after we've uh, planted the rye, or planted the beans. And then we also side dress everything, and this, and then I've also added a post-emerge sprayer onto my um, uh, toolbar. So I'm also I'm getting about 50 pounds of nitrogen, on, and I'm also getting my post application of herbicide here. We're doing a two trip, so that's what we're doing here, and we side dress most of our corn. Farmers will come up to me and have different questions or challenges with uh, using cover crops. It just doesn't work for them, or they're just not getting the yield, and I. Is over the years, I've just kind of summarized. I think there's just about four areas that they could, could work on or consider. Obviously, getting the planter set right, getting the nitrogen more of that corn and when that corn needs it. When we have a lot of residue out there in no-till, we're more carbon out there that's competing. The microbes are going after the, you know, the carbon using nitrogen. They're taking it from the corn, so that corn's maybe going short of nitrogen, so we have to manage that nitrogen a little differently. An easier one to manage are the insects. I think we attract a few more insects with the cover crops. We've got to manage that. That's an easy one. And then the fourth one's a time factor, and uh, that might be a little bit harder one to get through, but it takes a little time to get that soil structure, get that microbial life going in the corn. And so maybe your first one or two years out, you might experience some challenges, you know, getting, to, getting good stands and getting the kind of desired results. But, um, but four is a is a critical thing, and just trying to get through it. And uh, I'll just take one here. Look at the corn planters. This last year, we had a um, had a university come in and use their plot planter on one acre, and then uh, this is our planter here on the left. University planter on the right. This is our planter. This is the plot planter, and theirs was set up for no-till. But um, just comparing the two planters, we saw quite a difference. This was the plot planter that planted this. Their plot. And they were actually uh, studying seed treatments was the purpose of their plot. That's what they were working on. But not a very impressive stand at all. I mean, this looks a lot like some farmers would think cover crops typically look, and that's why they don't do it. That's just a pretty poor stand put in by that plot planter. My planter is on the left, and you can see I'm going to run the, the pointer right down through the, the split. The corn to the right was put in by the plot planter, the corn to the left was by our corn planter within one hour of each other. So this was just last year. And so you can see quite a difference. And really what we're doing, we're just comparing the planters. Same picture. It's kind of like an eye test. If you sit back, look at that, look at the corn on the left versus the right, you can see quite a difference in the, the two different planters. When that plot planter left that day, they probably left 40 to 50 bushels on the table. This here on the left was weighed out about 230 bushels an acre of what we put in with our planter. And we didn't have any rain in August at all last year. And so there's quite a different system the way you have your planters set. Just another look at it here. 
And I think that's a big deal. And that's one of the one of the challenges I think farmers are going to have is to get their planters set up to where they can move that residue, apply that nitrogen. Just a little bit about our nitrogen program. We're working um, in the fall with a little bit of ammonium sulfate, getting about 30 pounds actual out there to help start reducing the uh, carbon nitrogen ratio. I run just a little bit of anhydrous ammonia with what I don't get my hog manure on. We use uh, two forms of man uh, animal manures. We use swine and turkey manure in the fall and we'll do some in the spring to back. And then again on the corn planter, we're running um, about 60 pounds, 60 80 pounds of 32% uh, uh, nitrogen over three inches and down two, and then a little bit of infrared will pop up. I think that's pretty important, that nitrogen with the planter. I, I, I kind of think that's the one thing I'd really focus on if I was getting started. And then we come back and we side dress. We don't do this, we don't do all these in every field, but this is kind of a buffet of what um, We'll use one or two of these you know, in each field, and it'll vary from field to field. But um, we are getting different forms of nitrogen on throughout uh, many different times of the year. As I mentioned earlier, the third thing is the insecticides. We're going to get more army worms. They seem to be attracted by the, the right cover crop. We've always had cut worms. Stink bugs have been more of an issue. Probably never heard of stink bugs if you haven't used to cover crops that we get that, but uh, just a simple, um, uh, like a bathroid, a cyphalutherin, or a second generation pyrethroid in furrow, and also with your post spraying application will help take care of that. And uh, the other thing is, is the time factor. And as you saw this slide before, this is comparing the two fields. This is the tillage field, and this is the no-till field up here. And if this, if this farmer was to start no-till, no-tilling next year, you know, it's that soil is just isn't going to change overnight. It's going to take a while to kind of establish that soil structure and, and get the microbial life going in there. And so that's where I think the time factor um, is important. I just think you have to be aware of it and just not give up the first year, but just you know, to kind of go on a five-year program. We're going, to, we're going to make the changes that we need to make, and that soil wasn't formed overnight. You know, that's hundreds of thousands of years worth of you know, soil formation, and you're just not going to change the way your, your soil structure is, you know, in your field situation. But uh, this is showing one of my corn plots in a long-term um, no-till cover crop field. This here will be no-till 35 years this spring, 35, 36 years, I think. And uh, it, it happens to be one of my corn plots. And uh, I'm just showing there's a lot of farmers are concerned about the stocks that are out there, but this is the kind of yields that we're getting off of there the last couple of years. And, we're not having a bit of problem going through those stocks. And what we've noticed in the long-term no-till is that the, those stocks are digested so much easier. We're not using any stock choppers or, or, um, you know, any, you know, or anything on our corn head at all. It's just the microbial life in that soil is you know, working those stocks down. And that's something else that we see over time. But, uh, but it, it is a long-term thing. And this is my last slide, Luther, and I just... Uh, I want to say that you know our goal is we're just trying to stop soil erosion. We're trying to build our soil health and then raise good crops you know, at the same time. And so uh, I would encourage anybody, if you have questions, just uh, you can just shoot me an email at, uh, at this burger at netins.net, and I'd be glad to answer any of your questions too sometime. So I'll turn it back to you, Luther. Thank you, Steve. And we'll have a few minutes here for some questions, and I'll pick some of those out. Uh, the first one here... Uh, Steve is specific to what you were showing. You were talking about organic matter and showing those fields. This question to ask, did you look at the depth of the organic matter as it was it changing by depth? Uh, no, we did not. And um, we are taking uh, grid soil samples uh, for our manure plans and uh, we've been doing this for a number of years and I just went back and uh, started looking at, at these after the fact. and. Uh, I would suspect these are taken right at the plow layer, six, six inches, six and a half inches. But uh, no, we have not. I would suspect okay. that there's going to be more organic matter, of course, you know, on the top inch compared to, you know, six inches down. So. Okay. This next question asks about uh, alleopathy. Is there a problem with that um, after rye? And then there was another question related to it. Um, do you have to be more concerned about that with the crop that's following the cover crop? Either Mike or Steve, if you want to talk about that. I don't see much of a problem afterwards. Um, we have occasionally seen an emergence problem in corn when we get heavy, wet conditions. But uh, using Steve's system where we put uh, 
pop-up fertilizer in furrow and some to the side or at least 50 to 60 pounds on top. I really don't see much of an issue with uh, allelopathy on corn and soybeans at all. I've never seen any on soybeans. I've never walked out of a field and said I had an allelopathic problem. I've walked out of fields saying that this corn short of nitrogen, and for some reason the nitrogen is not getting to that corn. And to me, I think uh, if we do have any allelopathic issues, it, um, I think it can be easily corrected with uh, just shifting the nitrogen around. I think getting nitrogen on the corn planter and using your row cleaner. So, um, no, I, I've, the allelopathy doesn't um, enter into any of my thoughts at all. So. Okay. Another question asks about termination and using tillage or uh, terminating the cover crop without using herbicide. Do you want to address that? Um, most of the time, we, if we're terminating without herbicides, most of the folks are asking about crimping. And for the most part, uh, crimping normally has to be done at the reproductive stage on the cover crops to be effective at all. And we've, we've looked at different times and, and different percentages and on how well it works. And that's, that's a big issue. If you're going to think about tillage with a cover crop, then you've got to watch your cover crops, and you're going to have, probably have to do tillage when they're very small due to the root mass and the root wads and the crown to the plants. The only time I've come close to um, would be like in growing out soybeans where the rye is headed out. If I had a roller, I could have maybe rolled that rye one year, but um, we're always terminating our rye at you know six to seven inches, and we have to use herbicides to do that. Okay. Um, this also is kind of related to that. If you are using herbicide to terminate, do you have concerns uh, with residuals that might be hanging in the cover crop or there when they come back in with the following crop? We're worried about residuals uh, uh, that are post-applied especially, uh, carrying over too long into the fall. The first cover crops we normally see damage to the brassicas. They're, they seem to be very sensitive to a lot of the herbicides. The grasses are much less so. And, and uh, as people start pushing earlier and earlier planting dates on, on the cover crops, uh, we, we see some of the issues with that. Yeah, I, I don't see any issues with my soy rye. The only one that might come close, if I were to use oats in the fall and possibly atrazine that was uh, maybe a post-applied, might cause an issue, but um, I haven't um, had much experience with that yet. So. But uh, I, I don't have any problem at all with the soy rye. Okay. This question again relates to um, if the farmer is using tillage for spring termination, how soon prior to the planting the next crop should the cover crop be terminated? If you're going to use tillage, uh, terminate, terminate it with a herbicide and then doing tillage, I assume is what they're after. Uh, and the, the big issue that, that you start to think about running into is the type of tillage. And if we're looking at... Uh, you know, your gramoxone or, or glyphosate, that's not an issue for, for carrying in and doing the tillage. The problem we ran into years ago when we were doing tillage is the decomposition of, of the cover crops uh, can cause some real problems. And I've, I've actually seen hairy vests that was moldboard plowed uh, kill a stand of corn because the soil got so hot. So there's, there's some issues with that. Okay, um, let's move to another one. Do you see any emergence issues when planting into the greener rye? I guess, Steve, that might go to some of your pictures that you showed. Uh, no, I haven't. Um, just as long as we use uh, keep our row cleaner set, set right and we're using our infero uh, pop-up nitrogen, uh, we've, I've not seen any problem with that at all. Okay. And also, I think it's also I think important to make sure you got an insecticide in furrow too. If you can put in pop-up fertilizer, make sure you got a little bit of insecticide in there too, a couple ounces, of like a you know a, a pyrethroid. Okay. I see a lot of folks planting planting in the green all the time, 
uh, and frequently in in our part of the Midwest we have wet springs, and they they let the cereal rye grow until they they see that the crop's getting ready to start to come up, and they can see they got a good stand, and then they then they kill it as far as a moisture management tool, and it, it could be any of the cover crops. Uh, cereal rye's frequently done that way. Okay. Now, I know you didn't talk too much about livestock, and we did cover livestock a lot in prior sessions, but this question asks, uh, if you plan to graze the cover crop, what about herbicide restrictions from chemicals used on corn or beans? Any concerns there you'd express or they need to be aware of? Yeah, there are concerns. Some of the herbicides do have restrictions on them. depends on which ones you're going to use. Uh, one thing you need to look at is on soybeans, some of the, the seed treaters on soybeans have a have a grazing restriction that, that says 12 months. So you, you need to be, pay attention to uh, not only your, your herbicides, but as well as your seed treaters to, uh, to look at. So, And you can use a different herbicide so that, that allows you to graze in the fall. Mm -hmm. But you got to follow label directions. Yeah, so that's a testimonial for making sure you read your labels and understand the products that you're using and any restrictions that apply for what you want to do. We're about to the end of our time, so we're going to ask one last one. Um, Steve, I think this is going to go to you, is what type of row cleaners do you use? Uh, we use the Clean Sweep, uh, I think made by Precision Planning, and we have the Martin on those, and um, that works really well. Uh, we started out using uh, face-mounted uh, row cleaners years ago, and then we went to the, the clean sweep where it's, you know, you can use the air to raise them and lower them, and uh, that, works, that works really well. They're a floating row cleaner, and uh, they just do an excellent job. Okay. I'd recommend well, them, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank both of you, Mike and Steve, for your presentations today, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. This does end our series on cover crops. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors again, and they made it possible that we could bring you this information uh, and at no charge to you participating. And if you'd like to learn more about any other upcoming online courses and webinars that the American Society of Agronomy will be offering, you can go to our website, www.agronomy.org. And that will conclude our broadcast for today, and thank you, everyone.